Dr. Steve Jones joins us now from London. He is in the United States where he is doing a series for the BBC about origins and genetics. He is a geneticist at the University College in London. His book, The Language of the Genes, was the winner of the Best Science Book of 1994. He is a distinguished geneticist with a huge reputation, and I am pleased to have him here to talk about genes and also to talk about other things of interest to us in the world of science, including the current controversy in America about the bell curve, a book by Charles Murray, who was our guest last night. Welcome. It's great to have you here. You well, are here for the BBC series that you're doing? That's right. I'm just flying through in between Alaska, New York, and London. <laughs> Uh, the language of the genes. Let me talk about. Well, let me talk about about genetics first. In the sense, uh, there there is now. It seems to me more than there's ever been, and perhaps you can correct me. This fascination with genes and genetics because of the emphasis on somehow understanding genes beyond DNA is going to unlock a future perhaps way down the line, free from disease, and the genetic engineering will give us the power to do all kinds of things. So talk about, if you will, what genes, you know, the transfer uh, from one human species to another of basic material. I think there are some extraordinary things happening, and even more extraordinary things going to happen in the area which you discuss of genetic engineering. We already have, as many people know, um, potatoes even that will make human blood proteins. It's possible to put human growth hormones into pigs and make gigantic pigs. In principle, it might be possible to put genes from other creatures into humans. And that's all very interesting and all very remarkable, and people are right to be fascinated and even to some extent alarmed by it. My feeling, though, is that it's the less spectacular aspects of genetics which will turn out to be the most difficult to deal with. The they? ones which aren't so technical. Genetics, I think, the most dangerous thing that genetics gives us is knowledge. It tells us much more about ourselves as individuals than we might want to know. For example, I just yesterday happened to open a, the American Journal of Human Genetics, which is a prime journal in the subject. And in there they have a paper which makes it pretty clear that in principle you could tell a person, a young person, or even uh, work out when they're a baby, how long they're likely to live, just by looking at one particular part of their chromosomes, the ends of the chromosomes. Now, that's not quite yet done, but in principle, within 10 years, I think you could be told with a fair amount of certainty, and taking into account the danger of being run over by a New York taxi, which is ever-present, um, a fair amount of certainty whether you're going to die young, middle-aged, or old. Now, there's a lot of interesting questions there. Do you want to know? Does the insurance company want to know? Does your future partner want to know? So that's the kind of thing I think that genetics is going to be much more challenging about than these perhaps more, I hate to use the word conventional, but they are just high-tech medicine, genetic engineering. It's a new kind of medicine. It's nothing startling and novel. I want to come back to that because I've, I've talked about that subject on this broadcast in terms of how much do you want to know and what are the implications of that. But just stay with me on genetic engineering. Does it realistically offer some avenue to... Um, curing disease and preventing the transfer of genetic predisposition to disease? I think the answer is yes, um, just for some diseases at some time in the future. Like uh, breast cancer, now that they've identified the gene that causes breast cancer, does that mean that we're very close to discovering how to stop it? I think very close is a bit optimistic. But, you know, medicine is all about knowledge, and uh, any knowledge you have towards that is going to be of some help. But, of course, that also, it also faces you with a problem that if you have the gene, a woman has the gene for familial breast cancer, which, of course, is a small proportion of the total number yeah. of breast cancers, is she willing to take the option which might be offered of having a breast removed? before any symptoms manifest themselves. Um, but there certainly will be cases where genetic research, genetic engineering, will help cure disease. I do think, though, that, you know, as so often in medicine, it's not going to be the high technology that does the remarkable things. For example, an example I like to give, it's clearly the case now that there is a gene or genes that predispose certain people who smoke towards having lung cancer. If you have this gene and you smoke, you are extraordinarily likely to get lung cancer. If you don't have this gene and you smoke, um, you are really 
quite safe, reasonably safe. So that's why cancer. people can smoke until the end of their life and some live can. to be 80 years some, old. And, some people can. And all those people who say cigarettes don't cause cancer, they right. say, they, look, here, here's our They don't cancer. cause cancer to some people. But, and that was an interesting question. Now, if you're interested in getting rid of lung cancer, what do you do? Do you go into the genetics of this gene, how it works, how you might be able to transfer it into yeah. people who don't have it, or do you stop people smoking? And the answer is obviously to do the second thing, as is already happening. Charles Murray, on this broadcast last night, I don't have to tell you, because you're a geneticist, you know and, and read periodicals in America, this book is creating a storm of controversy. African Americans feel like he is saying a number of things. He on this broadcast, he says he's not saying those things, but they feel that he is saying that, that they are destined to have uh, an intelligence level that is below the level of whites in America, and that we are creating, therefore, uh, an assault on the level of expectation of people, and that he's arguing a whole series of things and about genes or destiny. You saw the interview that I did with him. You obviously know a lot about genetics. What do you think of Mary and his book? Uh, if I were to sum it up in a single word, I'd say worthless. Really. Why? Um, because it's scientifically fundamentally flawed. The, I, the, I work in the department at, the, at University College London, which is called the Galton Laboratory. It's named after Francis Galton, the founder of the so-called science of eugenics. He wrote a book called Hereditary Genius in the late 19th century. Apart from some statistical hand-waving, Charles Murray says nothing which is not in Hereditary Genius, okay? His, his arguments are less elegantly written than Galton's. Um, they're considerably more windy, and they say nothing more. That Galton idea that some groups are inherently inferior to, other, to, to others comes back again and again. I'm sure you know that the U.S. immigration laws until the mid-1960s were based on a model set up by an American geneticist, Davenport, the Charles Murray of his day, who felt that Jews were inherently inferior. They, he estimated that two-thirds of the Jews landing from Europe in New York in the 19, early 1900s were mentally defective. Therefore, the immigration rules were set up to prevent Jews from coming ashore, and thousands of Jews perished as a result of the equivalent experiment in eugenics that went on in the 1930s and 40s in Europe. And although Charles Murray, I'm sure, would dispute with great passion any link with that um, line of thought. To me, it's an absolutely linear, unbroken, and unchanged link, which depends on blaming the victim for their own problem.